Hello and welcome to With It. Um, what in the hell is that? We're gonna go over some stories that might seem unbelievable or rare and we're gonna see what there is as far as news, as far as any kind of information to back up these kind of things. And today we're gonna start with uh, a disorder that when you have it and you have the gene in your family and it's turned on, uh, you eventually have problems sleeping until you stay awake until you pass away. So we're going over FFI, Fatal Familial Insomnia. Stay tuned. Okay, we're gonna get into our story now. Uh, fatal familial insomnia. There's a gentleman named Giacomo over in Italy. Uh, he's one of these families that have this strain of this disease in his family. He was born in 1791. Uh, he had six kids throughout his adulthood. Three of them survived, so he ends up with three kids. And in 1836, at age 45, Giacomo fell ill. He had. Uh, uh, become bedridden, he was suffering from dementia, he couldn't communicate well, and he passes away. Now, his kids have a 50% chance that they have this in them, but right now, they put these deaths all the way through the strings of these deaths, they put it up to swelling of the brain or other kind of issues, and uh, swelling of the brain is going to be important when we get further down the lineage when we talk about Elisabetta, which is his great great granddaughter. Uh, so Giacomo has these three kids and his whole lineage, they're all successful. They have really good businesses over in Italy in their small town. And they're all successful, but they, the town knows that they have this kind of curse, they call it, going running parallel to their lives. And... Uh, the town even noticed it, that, that these people pass away at a relatively young age and from, from odd circumstances. So something's going on with this family and then uh, after so many people have passed away you get to the 1900s and Elisabetta is one of the lineage from Giacomo, great great granddaughter and she had watched her uh, aunt and her mother pass away from this, uh, uncle visited and she took him to the hospital and he ends up passing away in the hospital and it's the same hospital I believe it was her mother passed away in earlier. Uh, she, when she was at the hospital she has some medical background and uh, she was told that you know most of her grandfather died of uh, the swelling of the brain and so she looked at the spinal tap and she saw that it was clear the fluid was clear and I guess when you have the swelling of the brain it puts you know, some contaminants in that, so it's not a clear liquid. So she questioned that whole diagnosis and she started figuring that her family was dying because they couldn't get to sleep. So uh, doctors finally in 1985 had, had narrowed down, I believe they had solved mad cow disease before they solved FFI. And they're both similar and so is uh, Crutchfield Jacob is another one and these all have to do with motor skills and uh, pretty much shut off part of your brain from talking to the rest of your body. But in 1985, the doctors had finally found out that the prions, which are little things in your brain, instead of acting normal, they go malignant and they kind of, with the case of FFI, they, they do some scarring. They actually cut, put little cuts in the brain over and over until finally it cuts off uh, communication that controls sleep, it controls temperature, you start sweating profusely, uh, it controls appetite. So it really uh, messes with the brain. Whereas, whereas the mad cow disease, the prions again turn against the body and they poke holes. So it's poking holes in the brain, little holes all over the place and once enough holes get in there, that sets in and you pretty much can't function almost like FFI type of thing. So what happens in FFI is they have this thing and the average age that they pass away from this disease is 50 years old. Um, and you can have the gene and it might not be turned on and you never get it, 
But if you have the gene and it, and it turns on, then by the time it kicks in, and the first thing that happens is that you start sweating profusely. Uh, you, you, start, you start having trouble sleeping, but you're not awake all the time. You just start having these symptoms and uh, you lose motor skills, you lo lose your uh, coordination. So all these th three things hit early on with FFI when it's in your family. And there's only 100 families as of 1985 that had had this in their, 30 families that they knew of that had had this in their lineage. So it's a very rare disease, but there is a sporadic, something that you don't have to have it. So we'll get into that at the end here. Uh, but with the, with the fatal familial uh, Insomnia, once, once you get hit with the symptoms, it's about six to 36 months. So you got a half a year to about three years to live with this uh, before, it, before you finally cannot get to sleep. Um, like I said, those are the first few things that go wrong and then all of a sudden you can't communicate, you're bedridden. Uh, eventually you can't get to sleep. First you fall into a state where you're awake but you're dreaming. So people have movements like they're dreaming. Even though their eyes are awake, they're awake, that they may not be uh, totally cognizant of what's going on with them. And then you're awake long enough that your body, your body starts shutting down. Everything starts shutting down. A lot of them die from heart problems with it. Um, could be other ailments as far as your, your organs shutting down on you because you're not getting the rest that they need. So. Uh, uh, sadly, you know, this is 50 years old at the average of getting it, so Giacomo got it at 45, but people have had this and passed away in the teens, a 17 year old, I believe is the youngest I saw, that ended up having the disease hit and, you know, eventually took their life, so 17 years old. So while it is 50 years old is the average of the age that you pass away from it, it can be a lot younger and it can be quite a bit further on. and. Uh, some of the people that passed away from it were a lot older than 50 years in her family. Uh, but Giacomo ended up dying at 45 and I believe her, her grandfather died pretty young too, around the same age. So uh, a devastating disease. Um, they have now, they have done some, some studies on this as far as, you know, how you can manage it and there really is no cure and managing it is, you know, it doesn't seem to be extending their lives any longer than I think it would. Maybe it prevents the, the onset of the symptoms a little bit, but by the numbers and things I've seen, I, I don't see that it's uh, doing much. So it seems to be a disease, a very successful family over in Italy that you can't do anything about, even if you're rich. You can't fix what's wrong. And, uh, you know, that's a devastating thing to have to where only 30 families in the world have that. I mean, that, that is just so small. I mean, even if it was just 30 families in the United States, that's less than one per state. Uh, tiny, tiny amount of people that end up having this, but it's gotta be devastating for them. And then you gotta look at how it took till 1985 with all these people passing away from it. Uh, in the same family, they're dying young all the time. Well, yeah, you could think that there's something wrong, but they were all put in swelling of the brain or some other thing, uh, pretty much not knowing why they passed away. but. You can see that, you know, it's a thing where you can't get to sleep. And by the time I think when you really hit where you can't sleep, your communication skills are long gone. So you can't tell anybody if you want to. The only people that are going to see it are people that are with you 24 hours a day knowing that, and who's with somebody 24 hours, hours a day that doesn't know that they're not sleeping. It doesn't surprise me that this went as far as it did and as long as it did without being detected because of that. There's a sporadic, and this is where you don't have the fatal insomnia in your family, and it just pops up. And it has a little bit different uh, set in. It doesn't have the same sweating and, and the other things. It, it sets in a little bit differently, but the end result is exactly the same to where you're going to end up passing away because you can't get to sleep. And uh, anybody like me <laughs> that likes sleep cannot imagine this. I do play games where, um, you know, I'll stay up two days in a row quite often <laughs> just because I want to get stuff done or because I want to go fishing early in the morning. So I'll just stay up all night. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what ends up causing sporadic or what ends up getting it to happen, but it seems very rare and it seems as rare as the mad cow disease, which we heard about in the 80s and it kind of fell off the map since then. 
And you know, they say that they don't know how many people these things are going to affect, but we're here 40 years from when they found mad cow disease, and uh, I don't remember the last time I've heard about it. So, um, luckily, these things are very rare, uh, very deadly. <laughs> if you end up having a gene, um, Elizabetta, who ended up guessing correctly that it was a like lack of sleep that was killing her family members, and then she was. Uh, affirmed by the doctors that went ahead and looked into this. I believe the doctor that, that uh, found and, and uh, identified the prion and what it was doing and the FFI got a Nobel Peace Prize for it back in 86 maybe. So, uh, you know, it was a big discovery and, you know, they, it's one of those things that is not helping a ton of people, but you really need to try to see what you can do to help these people. So hopefully they'll figure out a way, now that they got it nailed down in 85, to eventually at least lengthen their lives and maybe shorten up the amount of time that they go through that because six months to 36 months is just brutal. And you're not awake that whole time. It's like the end of it, you're awake for maybe two weeks, maybe a week, and then you're done, but you can't get to sleep. And the sleep you're getting even before that is not very good at all. And they try to get to sleep and they get an hour or two hours or whatever it is, but they never get full sleep once the onset of this comes in. And then you start losing functions of everything. You're speaking, you're sweating profusely, you can't eat. Uh, it affects all that. So it's a very bad, uh, bad damage that it does to the brain to where it damages what you need to stay alive. All your organs need all of that uh, temperature control and, and nutrition and sleep. It needs all of that and you're getting none of it. Okay, a quick word on Elizabeth. Uh, she had her uh, family, they asked to check the whole family and I believe it was her family and they checked 50 uh, descendants of Giacomo that were alive and 25 of them, so 50% of them had that gene. Um, I'm not sure how they tell or if they can tell if that gene kicks in or not, uh, but pretty much you find out when it does kick in. Now sporadic, it starts off with double vision, cognizant problems, so you stop being able to recognize things, and it starts out with the motor skills, you know, your coordination goes. Now the family had lost 30 members, I believe it is, to, so Giacomo's family had lost 30 members of the family to this uh, fatal familial insomnia. I don't know what percentage it's at, that is, but that's, I believe that's from the 1836 forward. So, and this was done around 2000, so in 130 years, 30, 30 of the family members have passed away uh, from fatal familial insomnia. It also comes with pinpoint Dial, uh, pinpoint pupils because her uncle when he visited she said he was pale, he was sweating, he didn't look good and his uh, pupils were pin, pinpricks. That is also a symptom, an early on symptom of the disease and like I said eventually your organs just shut, shut down because you can't get to sleep. Okay in 1959, sometime prior to 1959 the record was set for staying awake and I believe it was uh, 10 days and some hours, it might have been, yeah, 10 days and some hours, I think it was. So Peter Tripp in 1959, he is a radio host, he's a talk show radio host. He decides to take his show out to a booth, a glass booth, it sounds like, in New York City, in Times Square, I do believe. And he sets up and he's going to try to break this record and he ends up staying awake <laughs> for 201 hours and does break the record. But they, they said that in a couple days he started getting irritable and then after that he started getting kind of loopy to where you're kind of dreaming and talking at the same time and uh, you know by the time you get to day 10 you're just irritable and you're cranky and uh, you're basically in a dream state. And then um, he finally finished that up and got out of the booth. and went on with his life. Some say that it had long-term effect on him and him and his wife had divorced shortly after that. Some theorized that it was because of that. I don't see any proof of that. Um, tried to look for something on that and I couldn't find it. So uh, that's Peter Tripp. Now a 17 year old in 1964 he decides he's going to break that record. He's going to break the 201 hour record which is what? Four days? Five days? Something like that? Uh, this kid is 17 years old, 1964. His name's Rudy Gardner. 
And he makes an announcement that he's going to try to break this record. But a doctor had seen um, Rudy announced that he was going to do this and he wanted to witness it. He wanted to get information for the medical community for what happens when you uh, don't get sleep. So Rudy Gardner goes in and he stays awake for 11 days and 20 minutes. That's 201 hours isn't, well that's about nine days. So he beat it by a couple days. Um, I'm not doing the math in my head for the 201 hours, but you know, an 11 day thing is over 240 hours. So uh, it's just insane to think that you would stay awake that long. And they came up with the same thing a couple days in, you get irritable and then you get into a dreamy state and then you get into like a, a almost paranoid state. And then you just are irritable and you're tired and you can't do anything. And uh, <laughs> Rudy Gardner staying awake for 11 days and 20 minutes. I can't imagine. Uh, I've only been awake for two days straight. So I don't know how anybody does that. Uh, there was also a, a TV show. What year was that? Um, 2004, there was a TV show, and I believe this was overseas, maybe in the UK, but it was called Shattered. And they had four contestants and they were going to compete to stay awake. And they go through this and I'm reading about this in this article and I'm like, well, where is these symptoms that I'm seeing? So I get to the end of the article and they're like, oh yeah, well, they gave them little nap breaks and other things. So they didn't stay awake that long. And I guess it was controversial when it was on. I don't remember it being on. Um, I never thought of trying, you know, people trying to stay awake like that. Uh, not something I would want to do. Like I said, I like my sleep. Your organs need sleep. Your body needs sleep. And who knows what kind of damage you do to your body staying awake for 11 days straight. Um, but I would think it takes a long time to get back into a normal flow of sleep-wake cycle after you do something like that. So uh, I'll put in a little article here about Giacomo's family that I went ahead and went, went across. And you guys can go ahead and read that. And I appreciate you joining me for the first show. If you have anything that makes you ask, what in the hell is that? Put it in the comments and we can take a look at what it is. I hope you'll see me next show.